first storm. If you're able, would you stand to your feet as we worship the Lord together today? As we thank Him for the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. Come on. Wandering to the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. I tried with all my might. But I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. A vagabond. And just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. You picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior. But to be me, my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friends Burden and bitterness You can't just keep it moving Nah, you ain't welcome here Come on, we say From now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing high this wayward son has found his way back Of God. 
could I hold glory for my own when I am just a man and you are God? Lord, we give you the glory. Cross is spoken, I am 
come on. Out of the side, lift it up. The roaring night declared the grave has no claim. Come on, then came the morning is declared. Then came the morning. Come on, lift it up louder. That's seen the promise. Come on, sing it out, church. You'll be
declaring the holiness of our God. In our worship today, we sang about what it was like at the cross and the resurrection, what it's like in the throne room when the angels say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with his glory. And a lot of times when we sing these words, we could see them as something that happens in the pages of our Bible, but sometimes we don't realize that we are a part of this story. That the story of redemption from the very beginning, if you have your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a part of that story. So when we worship, when we sing about the cross, we can imagine ourselves there in that moment. When we sing about the angels around the throne, we can imagine ourselves in that moment because that's what happens when we worship God. Truly, heaven and earth collide when we sing praises to our God. We are in the presence of a holy God. Holy, he is set apart but he will always be holy. He will be forever. The one who was and is and is to come, that is the God that is with you today. And maybe you feel alone. Maybe you're walking through a season of brokenness or grief or pain. Wherever you find yourself today, know that God that we are singing about, that God that we are worshiping, he is with you even now. Would you pray with me today? Father, we humbly bow our hearts in adoration before you. We declare that you are king over our lives. And God, maybe we have been in a place of making decisions based on what we think are the right ideas. But God, today we, we abandon living on the throne of our hearts and allow you to take that place. God, that we would follow what you are calling us to, what you are leading us to. God, and that's what the walk of the believer is about just taking steps of faith, knowing that you are there along the way. So God, today, I pray for every person in this room, everyone that's joining us online, those in our overflow venues, God, wherever they find themselves today, remind them that you are there. God, today, just as we were singing about the elders casting their crowns before you. God, all of our accolades, all of our achievements, all of our awards, the things that we have done in our own strength, God, we lay those things before you. And we say, have your way in our lives, God. All we want is you. God, would you speak to us by your presence, by your Holy Spirit, by the power of your word. God, we submit to the authority of your word. God, would you shape us into who you are calling us to be? We thank you for your presence with us today. And it's in Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen. Church, if you're thankful for Jesus, would you give him praise today? We believe he is worthy, amen. Hey, uh, it's awesome being in church with you today. Before you're seated, find two or three people around you. Maybe introduce yourself to someone you don't know, and then you may be seated. Good morning, Cornerstone. Who was here at the car show yesterday? You're tired, aren't you? I think you're tired. That's what it is. Oh, my goodness. Thousands of people from the community came to see over 175 cars and motorcycles. There were vendors and sponsors and food trucks. And it was just a great event to tell the community, hey, we're here when you have a need, when your family is in crisis, when you are searching for Jesus, Cornerstone is here for you. And so thank you to the volunteers that made yesterday happen. You are amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
People said, man, if that was your first one, it seemed like it was your 15th one with the way that it ran, but that's because of amazing volunteers. So thank you if you are a part of making yesterday happen. Now, if you're new with us, you just are joining us here at Cornerstone. We've got lots going on around here, but we're glad that you would choose to come and visit with us today. And I want to invite you just to text the word NEW to 951-425-4425. Let us treat you to something over at the coffee cart across the patio. Just our way of saying thanks for being with us here today. We're glad that you would choose Cornerstone to be a part of. And so give it up for all those that are visiting today, if you would. They may be sitting around you. You may have shaken their hand. We're glad that you are here and a part of what we have going on here. Now, here's some things coming up. Thursday night is what we call prayer night. Twice a month on Thursday nights, we a group of people gather together, pray for one another and the community, the church, and around the globe. And so if you want to be part of that, you can just come 6.30 to our multi-purpose room and be part of that team that is praying together. It's just people that gather together on that night. They have it available and just uh, spend some time in prayer together. And then next Sunday after the last service is what we call our family meal. It's there that we just have lunch together. It is limited because we are going to be inside the chapel next Sunday after third service. So if you'd like to be a part of that, text the word meal to our church number. And then today is all about groups. The new season has started. If you haven't found your people and you haven't gathered together in a group, our groups team is out on the patio this morning. They can answer any question you have about groups, when they're meeting, what they're studying, who's in them, all that kind of thing. This is a great way to start groups. You can text the word group or go see them out on the patio today make that a priority to get involved and then saturday night is what we call boardwalk bash if you think moms and dads like uh, going back to school night it's your opportunity to see what our kids do on a sunday morning and so you are going to see the boardwalk and what they do beforehand worship together go to their classes find out what they're studying what they're doing and who the volunteers are that are part of that and so that's saturday night And then all throughout the month, we'll be collecting candy out on the patio for our next event on October 31st, which is Trunk or Treat. And so if you could participate by just bringing a bag and dropping it off, we want to be a blessing to the community to have a safe place in which to do Trunk or Treat. There you go. There's all that. Go to the website because you tuned out for the last two minutes. So it's all there. You can see it on the website. But we're glad that you would choose something to get involved in and allow this to be your community of people. There's a small group that, of, of, of those that are involved in our community missions team this last week that partnered uh, with Oak Grove. It's a, a mission for the troubled teens. And they helped plant gardens this last week so that they could get their hands dirty, get their, their hands down into the, to the earth and, and, and grow plants and, and fruit and vegetables and, and whatnot. And so our team is going to continue to help manage and maintain and harvest alongside Uh, Oak Grove. And so that's what happened this last week. And if you ever want to be part of that, you can go to our website and see what the team is doing next. But community missions happens because of your generosity. It's because that you give that allows people to go and be a blessing to a ministry like that. And so today, whether you give by text or you go onto the church app or on the website or you utilize the the envelopes and the seat backs in front of you and drop it off in a box, know that you're giving is what allows people to be blessed in this community. And so I want to pray for you uh, right now, if you bow your heads with me. God, you are good, and I pray for each and every family that is represented here. I pray that you would be a blessing in their life. Lord, I know that if they've got it, it's because you gave it. You gave first, and we give back to you, Lord, knowing that you will multiply it and increase it for the sake of the kingdom. And so this morning, I pray that you'd bless each gift and each giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus had been healing all kinds of people from all kinds of sicknesses and diseases and just doing miracles. And so it wasn't a surprise that next day when Jesus decided to base himself in in a house and minister to people that it was packed. People were coming from the, the whole city, from all the towns around saying, Maybe Jesus can heal, you know, my family, this person as well. We want to hear the words of this prophet. And it was so busy that even when uh, an emergency would happen, there was, wasn't room. And so these, these four guys hearing about Jesus said, well, if he can do all that, 
and they brought their paralyzed friend on a mat. They carried him to Jesus. Problem is, nobody, nobody would move. It's like asking Christians to scoot to the middle of the aisles. We'd make room for our guests. It's just not going to happen, right? I mean, but, you know, nobody would move. And so they were like, but, but we're here for this. And so they didn't give up. They climbed on the roof. They opened up the roof, trashed this person's roof, and they lowered this man down with ropes right before Jesus. All of a sudden, Jesus sees the, the sky through the roof. And, and when he watches what is happening, it says in Mark chapter 2, and he saw their faith, not even uh, the singular, the person who was paralyzed. He saw the faith of the four friends. And when he saw that kind of faith, he, he looked at that person and said, son, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees didn't like that because only God can forgive sins. That should have been their hint on who Jesus was saying he was going, that he was. And so in that moment, Jesus was declaring that, that he was God. He had the power of God. He could forgive sins. But how could people really believe that just because he said it? And so he turned to them and said, he said, take up your mat and walk. And when that miracle happened, people started wondering, maybe he is the son of God and can forgive sins. You see, it was Jesus doing that good deed that showed people who he really was. The friends had this kind of faith. What we say isn't proof for what we believe. You can even say, no, 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 but I believe this. But what we say isn't actually the proof for what we believe. It's what we do that shows what we really believe the strongest. And we can tell, we can do an inventory and see if we really believe by looking at the schedule we keep, the content we watch, and the budget we spend. What do I mean by that? Um, are there things that keep you from the Lord? Are you prioritizing being a part of the family of God, serving the Lord? Thankfully, on the West Coast, we can, we can still sneak in a, a service before the football game start. We, got our on, we see our online numbers spiking during the NFL season. We know where you are, right? But I'm thankful we at least have that. And when I say the content you, you watch, I mean, you, you can tell your wife all day long, I love you. But when you're looking at porn, you're also saying, I'm not that into you. That's, I mean, your actions are speaking louder than your words. It's the truth. And with the budget you spend, if, you, if we were just to look, and this is a terrifying thing to do, but if you just look at the last month of what we spend, we will see, you know what? Coffee is a priority for this, for this family, or this is a priority for this family. I'm just saying, what we do is actually showing what we really believe. James chapter two, this is what James is trying to say to us. He says this in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims they have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? James isn't saying, are people saved by faith? Because the scriptures are clear. We're saved by God's grace through faith, right? He's not saying that. He's saying, can such faith, can a faith void of good works save someone? He's challenging the reality of saving faith if there are no works there to back it up at all. So does merely talking about our faith indicate that someone really has faith? James is going to repeat himself a bunch in these paragraphs because he really wants us to get this. And we're going to learn that saving faith goes beyond theology, thoughts, and even how we talk. It's got to be more than those things. Verse 15 James says, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and be well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Saving faith goes beyond just words to provide for real needs that we're seeing. James says that we will, we will treat people like family. Family in Christ really matters. He calls these people brothers or sisters. Right, we talked about that last week. And, and faith is going to meet a real need. James isn't saying that faith has to meet every need. God isn't saying, my plan is to bankrupt you so that they can be you know, doing okay. That's, that's not the, I'm not saying every need. But faith is going to meet real needs. When, when your friend's prayer request is, Lord, just provide so I can upgrade to the newest iPhone, it's just not something you have to worry about. That's not on the concern list of, of, of the Lord. We're not talking about luxuries, but real needs. 
I tell plenty of stories of uh, mistakes that I make in life, you know, like overfilling my hot tub for hours and then that overfilled my pool and that just was horrible. Um, so I tell you all those stories. So I figured once a year, I'll tell you a story about how I live victoriously for Christ as well. Uh, but I, I don't know if it was 15 or 20 years ago, um, but I remember a friend of mine, one of my closest friends was serving with me in youth ministry at a church in New Jersey. He had tried everything and just couldn't figure out how to make the last $500 payment for rent. He talked to family. He asked, you know, tried getting a loan. He just tried figuring it all out. And, and finally he said, Andy, do you think, do you think the church could, could help me out? I've tried everything. I really have. I'm a hard worker. I said, well, I can ask. And as, when I went to go present his need to the church, just in that walk, the Lord made it really clear, like, well, well you have $500. Why don't you give it to him? I'm like, well, he didn't ask for me to do it. He asked for the church to do it, Lord. <laughs> Right? This must have been, I don't, I don't know if we were married yet, Shannon. Uh, yeah, because we wouldn't have had the money. You would have spent it. No, I'm kidding. You're beautiful. You're so pretty. You're worth the $500 I don't have. Listen, but I also said it first service. Forgive me. Um, listen, is it possible that the discovery of the need is God's request for you to meet that need with the resources that he's already blessed you with? When the Lord showed that to me, and, and I asked the church, I said, hey, can I, can I give you $500 and can you just write him a check and don't tell anyone what, you know, who it's from, which I think is technically legally money laundering, but it's fine. <laughs> and, and they did that. And when, when that happened, then I just kind of waited anxiously and it was like four days later, where he's like, you won't believe it. I got a check for the money. Thanks so much for telling the church to see the joy. He's, he, he said, God did this. He's like, God provided for me. The joy of me, just me and God knowing the secret and one person in accounting and now a thousand of you. <laughs> it's been 15 years. Listen, the joy of that carried me through the rest of the year. God used me to meet a need. And sometimes as we discover the needs, that's God's indication of us meeting the need. Now, sometimes, you know, we, we need to realize this story tells us somebody's coming in and they, they, they don't have the clothes to stay warm and the food He's saying, how crazy is it if you were to say, oh boy, I just bless you uh, with uh, God's warmth and uh, I pray that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's like, I want actual warmth, a coat, and I want food. F fill me with food, not the Holy Spirit. Like, you gotta meet the practical needs as well. Faith-filled words don't help practically. Sometimes what someone needs most in life is faith-filled words. Uh, we, we know that. There are times where God is calling us. The main thing is to listen, to pray for someone, and to encourage them. And that's exactly what they need. But when they need a coat and a cup of soup, that isn't where it ends right there. So James is saying, for, for true faith, if it's not accompanied by action, it's, it's dead. It's one thing for us to say about ourselves, I, I love people. I love people. It's an entirely different thing for other people to look at our lives and say, they love people, he or she, they, they love people, and I can see it, I see that they love people. I'm aware of the, what the Bible says about uh, giving gifts and praying in, in private, but it's gonna spill out, it's gonna leak out, and people are going to notice our heart for others. James is saying that a fruitless life is never the description of a believer in the Bible. It's just not a description of someone who believes in the Lord. And, and just like in Mark chapter two, people saw the power of God released when Jesus helped somebody practically, people can still see stuff like that today. As God allows us to answer those needs, God's power and his provision and his care can be seen by other people and they'll give God glory for our good works. It's gotta be God talk with God acts. It's got to be that combo. So saving faith goes beyond just words. And saving faith goes beyond good theology to be something that is visible for others to see. Verse 18. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have deeds. And James's response is, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. But even the demons believe that and shudder. What's James saying here? Listen. Theology that is good, it's good. I'm glad theology is good, but it's not visible and other people can't witness that. He says, you got to show me your faith with your deeds. Here's a real scary thing. You can go to hell with good theology. 
We call it academic faith. Like, an, oh, that person has an academic understanding of the faith, right? We say like, oh yeah, that person is accurate in what they're saying about Jesus, the cross, and salvation. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be in heaven. There's gotta be something different than doing what the demons believe. The demons, if you look throughout the scripture, have really accurate theology. They know that Jesus is the son of God. They even know eschatology. They're like, you're, you're, you're banishing us before the time. They're speaking about the end times. Demons accurately believe about Jesus, but thank God they're not gonna be our neighbors in heaven. And there will be people that accurately understand salvation and Jesus and haven't received it themselves. That's terrifying. Spurgeon said it a little nicer. He says, grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. There needs to be something that happens, some kind of transformation. James is saying, even the demons had a little visible reaction. When they were around Jesus, they would shudder, they would tremble at, at, at that truth. So because they believed he really was God, it would cause them to, to physically tremble in those moments. There was at least something that happened in their lives to believe and shudder. Shannon's been reading to the, to the family this uh, missionary bios. We've got 50 missionary bios. We're taking years to work through them, trying to end our evenings reading something that's encouraging and inspiring. And uh, this one lady has a really unfortunate last name, but she's an amazing lady. Her name's Lillian Trasher. Lillian Trasher, uh, now, today, she's known as the mother of the Nile, like the Nile River. And she is estimated to have helped 10,000 orphans, widows, and homeless, and she created the first orphanage in Egypt. But before all of that, she was serving at a local orphanage in, in America, and she decided to go out and listen to a missionary from India come and share his story while he was home in America. And when she heard the story of the need that was out there, she began to weep in that meeting. She, she wept on the way back. When she got home, she had to go to her room and people knew something was wrong. The next morning, the other workers, they were like, are you, are you okay? What happened last night? And she had a burden that was really uncontrollable where she knew God was calling her to be a missionary. But the beginning stages of that was some kind of a visible reaction. She didn't tremble like the demons, but she wept like a child of God, hearing about the need that was out there. She was halfway there at that point when things, the faith was moving from her head to her heart. Eventually it would move to her hands. The truth James is saying here is, I will show you my faith by my deeds. Our faith is only as valid uh, as the object of our faith. A and the strength of our faith is determined by how much we're interacting with that object or our experience with it. And so for instance, a traffic light, often the response is when we're at a traffic light and it turns green, we, we just have faith. We wouldn't call it faith, but we have faith that the other lights are red so we can safely pull forward. A and so we, we believe that. Shannon's faith is not doubting in uh, traffic lights, but in other people texting while they're going through the opposite traffic light, as just a day or two ago, a car blew through the red light, hit another car, and it spun towards her and just missed her, and I could tell she was shook up all day from that. We, we still have faith in traffic lights. We don't have faith in people that are, that are looking at, so we're, we're looking back and forth at them. I don't really have faith in my alarm clock. And so I set every Sunday morning only, I set 10 alarms to go off at different, I'm like, I gotta be, you know, and my greatest fear, I have nightmares of this, of showing up to church at like 940 and you guys are just sitting here waiting, waiting for me. So I don't really have much faith in that, so I set multiple alarm clocks in that. Listen, if the strength of our faith grows with our experience with the object that we're putting our faith in, that means the more time you spend with Jesus, in the word, in prayer, at church, in, in life groups, the more time you spend with the Lord, the greater your faith will be because he will always show himself reliable and trustworthy. So saving faith goes beyond just good theology to become visible to others. And saving faith goes beyond even personal feelings to act with sacrificial obedience. Verse 20, you foolish person, James is in a mood, <laughs> you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. 
And the scripture was fulfilled that said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous or justified by what they do and not by faith alone. This is pointing back to uh, a story that is difficult that we wrestle with in Genesis chapter 22, especially if you're new to the church and you haven't heard this story, you need to slow down and ask some questions and read Genesis chapter 22. But, but this is a time where God had already promised to Abraham, he's like, go, go, to, this, go to this other country, leave everything and follow me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you a father of nations. He had to wait until he was 100 years old before he became the father of Isaac. But he was not yet the father of nations. But then all of a sudden, that same voice, that same God that, that told him about this blessing said, all right, now I want you to take your son Isaac, your only son, and offer him as a burnt offering. You're like, what is, that? What is going on here? And, and the next day, he got up, and we had his, uh, had his servants with him, and, and, and he got the wood, and he, and he had the fire, and they traveled three days to this mountain, and then he left the servants behind and said, all right, Isaac, we're, we're going. And Isaac even says, very dramatically, Father, I see the wood, and I see the fire. Where is the, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And, and Abraham says, that God will provide that lamb for us. And he gets there, and God hasn't provided it yet, and so... He doesn't know how this is all gonna work out. He knows that Isaac is supposed to bear him children, but God also said to offer him as a sacrifice, and, and that's a one-time thing in history. God never intended Abraham to do that. He was going to stop him. It was all for an amazing foreshadowing of the future when God the Father would offer his son as a sacrifice for all of our sins. It was a beautiful foreshadowing, but at that moment, it wasn't very beautiful. And as he was about to do that, all of a sudden, God spoke from heaven in a way where I think even Isaac could hear so that Isaac and Abraham would be cool the rest of their lives. And he said, don't do it. Here, and over there, there was a ram caught in the brush and they offered that ram. And God said, now that I know that you, you know, love me above even your own family, watch what I'm gonna do to bless you. And, it, and it's, it's a story that is partly cringy because you're like, why would God do that? But knowing that God would never allow it to happen and knowing how it just paints the perfect picture of Jesus. If you read Genesis 22 after you've read the Gospels, you see this foreshadowing of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. Abraham had faith that he was acting on. Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God would even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the death. Do we, do we have strong feelings that contradict the word of God and what God is calling us to do? Of course we do. Of course we do. There are all, all the time we have feelings of, of wanting to go in a different direction than where God is leading us to go, whether it's resisting sin or serving him passionately. We have to make a sacrificial decision to leave our feelings behind and follow the truth of God's word. Faith obeys God by working together with physical actions. It says his faith and his actions were working together. Right, it's a, it's a partnership. It's not just faith and it's not just good deeds. It's I'm doing these things because I love the Lord to point people to the Lord. It's not just good intentions with faith saying, I wanna do these things one day. No, it's actually going to partner together. And obedience perfects faith, allowing you to see God's work and his good plan and his good intention. We're told faith was made complete by what he did. I was thinking this week about what amazing power and provision and even the providence of being in God's story at just the right moment do we miss out on when we stop at good intentions instead of letting our faith be completed with good works, acting on those good intentions so that we could actually see what God was doing providentially. Like there are times we miss that for sure. God can still bless the people that we were supposed to bless in his own ways, but we, we miss being a part of that. We miss being the ones that are an answer to God's prayer. Don't miss being a part of someone else's spiritual journey. Don't miss being someone's answered prayer. I mean, somebody is weeping before the Lord saying, Lord, show up. Lord, show me your power. Show me that you still care. And then that, they're weeping about that, begging the Lord. We just feel like a tug on our heart and a thought that's good. We're like, maybe I should call that person. Maybe I should bless them. Maybe I should give them this. And sometimes we dismiss that as just a good thought. 
But if it doesn't con contradict the word of God and you're able to meet that need or make that phone call, think about how you can be a part of God's providence and his provision towards other people. Lillian Trasher, if she stopped at a good thought and a weeping heart, not one of those 10,000 kids and, and people that she helped would have been held, would have been saved, would have been provided for, would have been giving God the glory, would be maybe even in the kingdom. But she decided to move from this thought in her head to letting it just show in her heart, and then she let it move to her hands, and she began to act on it. And, and history changed in Egypt because of that. I even read that there's a lot of Lillians uh, and, and trashers somehow, but there's a lot of those names in Egypt because of how many people she's helped in that time period, and that name has carried on and on. I don't know why, but when I was writing that part of this sermon down at a coffee shop, uh, my, my eyes filled with tears. Some of them snuck out. It felt a little uncomfortable being in public like that. And, I, and I'm still sorting through what the Lord's doing in my heart, what he's calling me to do. But I felt compelled to say, it could also be for you in the sense that if, if there is something God has called you to do to meet somebody else's need, but you are hesitating in doing that, uh, the Lord wants you to do that. The Lord wants you to do that good work. Well, what if it was just a good thought and not the Lord? You're gonna get blessed for it because it's a good thing that you're doing in the name of the Lord. And don't miss out on what God is trying to do. You see, it says a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. You're like, I don't know, that statement doesn't sound right. Well, yeah, if you, if you read the New Testament, it can sound a bit weird because the Apostle Paul seems to say the opposite, doesn't he? He says this in Ephesians chapter two. It's by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, listen, not by works so that no one can boast. So are Paul and James kind of fighting over two opposing views? They're fighting back to back against other people. Paul is fighting legalism. James is fighting laziness. Paul is fighting people that are like, I earn my way to heaven. I'm a good Jew. I follow the law. Gentiles should become Jewish if they want to go to heaven. He's fighting legalism. James is fighting lazy people who are like, oh, saved by grace, I'm good. I raised my hand once, I'm good. I prayed a prayer once, my, my life has never changed since then, but I'm, but I'm good. James is fighting against that. And if we're honest, our struggle, not for everybody, but our struggle in our culture isn't as much Paul fighting against legalism as it is James fighting against lazy, right? And it's not our fault. It's not our fault that they have made couches so unbelievably comfortable. Oh my goodness, and the TVs are getting bigger and cheaper? It's magic, right? Of course you wanna sit on the couch and never leave, right? It's, it's Satan, he's in the furniture business. He's the, one, he's the one advancing the TV components. He developed OLED or whatever, it, you know. He wants us to sit there, right? Listen, I, I, that's what we're fighting against. When Paul uses the term justification, I think he's talking about our salvation from, from God's perspective. When James uses the term being considered righteous or justification, he's talking about how we prove our faith to others. And, and I know whether, whether you've said it or somebody said it to you, when they say things like, don't judge me, you don't know about my relationship with God, they're right, right? Matthew 7 exists. Pull the log out of your own eye before you talk about a speck in someone else's eye. But we know the difference from someone who's struggling and somebody who is gladly embracing and celebrating sin. There's a difference. And we experience it in our lives. We can see it in other people's lives. And it's just, you, you can't, you might not be able to tell someone else because of what I'm seeing in your life, I don't think you're a Christian and I don't think you're going to heaven. That's probably too much because there's one judge and one lawgiver. But you also can't give them any assurance of salvation because we're told in the Bible and 1 John and throughout the Gospels that the only way we can really be sure the Holy Spirit has made us born again is if we have these new desires for God's word and, God, and God's people and, and his heart. And if there's fruit, and that fruit will be visible. We're supposed to do plenty of stuff private. Pray privately, give privately. It's gonna leak out. It's gonna spill out where other people are gonna be able to notice that God's doing a work in our lives. And so James isn't saying that salvation is, is you know, by works. He's not saying it's faith and works. He says it's faith that works, faith that is effective to transform. Faith alone justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. It's gonna be accompanied by some level of transformation. We don't judge the speed of someone's transformation, uh, the amount of their transformation, but there should be a trickle of transformation if we wanna have any assurance of our own salvation. 
And James here is finally saying that saving faith goes beyond your past to embrace a new life and a new community. It says in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Your past doesn't disqualify you from God's blessing. You feel kind of bad, but even the writer here is recognizing, he's like, even Rahab, the prostitute, is going to heaven. I don't know about you, but I know there's a few evens in here where like, even Andy is going to heaven, right? Hey, praise God for his grace and his mercy. Maybe you're an even like me, but your past doesn't disqualify you from God. Right, God is wanting to welcome you into his family. But you must leave your past to join God's family. That's the illustration of Rahab. She had to make a choice. Her people had heard of the Israelites defeating Egypt, the greatest power. They had heard of the, the 10 plagues. And she chose in her heart to say, you know what? That's, I want that to be my God. That God is real and powerful, not this fake thing that, that we worship that's doing nothing for us over here. And so when all of a sudden, providentially, she bumped into the spies of Israel, she hid them, and then she told them where to go hide so that they could succeed in getting back. And she said, but please save me and my family. So she hung a scarlet cord out of her window in Jericho, gathered her family that would also believe. And what she did is she fully left her culture, her past behind. Anyone that would believe was in that room with her. She didn't say, yeah, yeah, I sold us all out, Jericho, but I still love you guys. I'm still, you know. No, she had to make a choice. They became her enemy when she chose to follow the Lord. She embraced God's family, God's community. Contact with Jesus changes us, never making us perfect, but always pushing us to progress with the Lord. Jesus is the only perfect one. Nobody should tell you that you have to be perfect. But your heart should want to be Christ-like. Your heart should want to be to be used by God's kingdom. And faith acted on is rewarded. Hebrews 11.31 tells us for Rahab, it says, by faith, the prostitute Rahab, they love labeling her, but I think it's just to encourage us because we know our past. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. There was a reward there. The truth James is saying again and again in different ways is, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. We profess our faith and we practice our faith. It's got to be both, no matter how distracted we are, no matter how um, you know, uh, discouraged we are because our feelings are heading in the other direction, there's got to be a way to practice this. And so as we look at James chapter two, we have to reflect. We reflect on our faith and say, do, do I have saving faith? Like, do I really have same faith? Has God really made me born again? And the only way to answer that is say, do you, do you have new desires? Like, do you, do you love the Lord? Do you love his word, his, his people? Are you starting to hate your sin? You sin, but do you yeah, hate that part about who you are? Reflect on saving faith and reflect on your good works. And, and ask yourself, like, is, man, is my story as old as Andy's? He came up with one from 20 years ago. I hope he's got some new stories of, of good works. Has it, has it been a while? Reflect on your good works, right? And, and try and figure out how to have healthy habits and spiritual disciplines of, of responding to needs that you see. But maybe it's that you're sitting here and thinking, yeah, I don't think I have saving faith. I don't think it's changing me in those ways. And you need to receive salvation. John 1, 12 says, but as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. If God is speaking to your heart today about, about living it out, then I would encourage you to do what we said a few weeks ago and, and text the word CARES to our church number and join the Cornerstone CARES team where we're gonna try and minister to this group of people that we see identified in the book of James. We've had 70-something people um, text in. We, we want a couple hundred texting in so that when there's needs that we start sharing over the next couple of months, that we have multiple people meeting those needs and being a blessing to our community. That's a great way to practically say, I wanna provide for the real needs for those that are, that are around me and hurting. But if you're a step before that saying, I need salvation, I need to be a part of God's family, whether you've realized that you've had faith, but James is questioning the reality of your faith and so are you now, or whether you've never made a commitment to put your trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, I wanna give you an opportunity to do that. And so if you guys would all just close your eyes and have an attitude of praying for those around you, if you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ for your salvation today, just raise your hand and I'll lead you in a simple prayer. Awesome, great, awesome. 
Hmm. We have many people today in the first service also. Is there anyone else? Hmm. These specific words aren't magical. It's just as best as I can express a heart that wants to surrender its life to Jesus. You could say something like this out loud or in the quietness of your own heart. Just say it sincerely. Say, Father in heaven, please forgive me of my sins. I repent of them. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins, took my punishment, and raised again three days later. Fill me with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And would you transform my life so that I could have assurance of my salvation as I begin to desire godly things and to do good works for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys that made that decision. It's a big decision, so if you text the word journey to the church number, we're here to support you and help you. Please do that. Let's go and do some good works.